Well, uh, let's look at a, a few more things uh, here in our <laughs> final afternoon session on Saturday. Uh, this little uh, chart on page 12, the win and the wear, uh, or the wear and the win, uh, gives you a little bit of a timeline and helps uh, chronologically put the uh, uh, the prophets, and, and here I am uh, using the prophets as we typically consider them prophets, uh, the major and the minor prophets, and uh, we'll talk about uh, that again here in some in just a moment, but I didn't want to leave uh, Daniel out, uh, and so we're, we're really going to, despite everything I've just said, we're going to focus now on uh, those books, which are, as we'll see in a moment, the latter prophets, and we'll uh, consider these, and uh, to put them in uh, some kind of chronology beginning with 850 BC, all of these are BC dates, going down to 432 BC. Uh, any chronology you look at in the scripture is going to be slightly different. In fact, I think it was Keith asked me a question about a chronological study Bible. Uh, during the during the break, and I said, you know, chronological study Bibles can be very helpful uh, for reasons like this of getting things chronologically in order and realizing that Joel wrote a long time before Malachi. And those of us who are reading the uh, Bible or interpreting the Bible uh, literally, grammatically, historically, well, you got to know what's the history of. Uh, where, uh, where Daniel comes in and that he's in the exile or really kind of pre-exile if you uh, consider 605 uh, and uh, to, to begin to put all that together. They can be very helpful. Now, another thing about a chronology is that uh, some parts of the scripture more than others are very difficult to put in chronological order. In fact, not even all the prophets uh, give us uh, much date or we, we have to kind of presume some of them, like Isaiah, you remember in the year of King Uzziah or the year of the earthquake, and they, say, they, they put some things that give us a date, but uh, other books don't give us like Obadiah, we wonder, you know, should it go here or should it go there? So anytime you see somebody's chronology, it has somebody's interpretation behind it. Uh, which means, again, you have to question that assumption. But taking this, uh, we would go from 850 down to 5, uh, 432 B.C. And uh, I have uh, divided it uh, really into the north, the south, and beyond. Uh, and uh, there are really only uh, two, actually, I think three uh, prophets. I must have uh, uh, messed up on Nahum here because Nahum, I believe, uh, is a uh, really, he prophesies most about Edom. Um, and uh, so let's move that over a block. Uh, but uh, as, uh, as we uh, look and consider this, uh, those who were prophets in the north, uh, Hosea, Amos, Isaiah. Now, a lot of what we have in northern prophets actually, uh, and does anyone remember the most famous prophet to the north? Not Isaiah, because that's on the, on the chart and that would be too easy. <laughs> His name was Elijah. <laughs> you know, all, uh, today we haven't talked about Elijah, have we? Uh, and Elijah, very clearly a prophet, wasn't he? And yet, uh, when we say we're going to study the prophets, again, this is one of, the, one of the things we trip up over is because we've got a section of the book of the prophets, we're not necessarily studying Elijah. Now, in the... Uh, in the Nevi'im, you've got First and Second Kings, uh, First, Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. You would definitely be studying Elijah uh, as a part of that content. Again, so uh, the the packaging of it really does make a lot of difference. But uh, Elijah going to King Ahab, you remember, and uh, 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 Jezebel, and all those uh, the prophetic warnings that were given to the north. Much of that they didn't have a book that was. Uh, that was focused on that. But Hosea and Amos definitely were focused on that nor those northern kingdoms. And some of Isaiah, I put Isaiah in both uh, places because much of Isaiah was uh, later on and was uh, toward the south, uh, but uh, some of it towards uh, the north. Now the south or the southern kingdom, uh, the kingdom of Judah, uh, began <laughs> with uh, Joel and goes uh, down through most of these. If you uh, uh, will look in, in fact, in another chart and see that some of these, like uh, beginning with Daniel on, were either in the exile or in the post-exile uh, period. And uh, you can know that by the uh, chronology. And then those who go beyond Jordan, again, there's only two of them, uh, three, including uh, Nahum. 
Uh, the period in uh, which we look and consider here, uh, the, uh, the time before the fall of Israel, uh, and we're putting uh, Israel destroyed at uh, 722 BC, uh, the uh, beginning of the, uh, uh, the, 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 those who began their ministry prior to the fall of Judah, they may have completed their ministry later, but they began their, their, their uh, ministry here. Uh, the first exiles went in 605 BC when Nebuchadnezzar took over Babylon. Uh, those who began their ministry during the exile, uh, which would be uh, those like Ezekiel, uh, Jerusalem fell in 586, and uh, those who began their ministry then after the return of the exile, and those three post-exilic prophets then were Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Now, uh, the, uh, the purpose of uh, this is that if you want to read the prophets the books of the prophets chronologically, this is the way you would read it. You would start with Joel and uh, you would work your way down to Malachi and uh, include those others in. Uh, and so you take Joel, he's the earliest prophet and he's a prophet to the southern uh, kingdom and yet he's got some of the most uh, uh, relevant prophecies for our day and uh, in the future day, when, especially once when you get into chapter 3, uh, I suppose from Joel you probably learn more about the day of the Lord than any other prophet. Uh, from Joel you learn about the day of Pentecost, for example. So where you put it in the chronology almost doesn't matter as to, in, in terms of where they're prophesying toward. Uh, and where they're prophesying toward, uh, you say, well, Joel was prophesying toward the southern kingdom. Well, yeah, he was, uh, but as it relates really in a broader sense all the way through. But if you want to read it chronologically, this is the way to, read it, uh, to, to begin to do that. You take Malachi, which is the most recent uh, prophet, uh, somewhere 432, 400 years before the time of Christ. And uh, it really is the uh, prophet that helps us to understand the state of Judaism as the, as, as the Hebrew scriptures close out. Uh, and you've got those 400 years of silence, and we can kind of know, uh, interpret a little bit what happened in those 400 years just on the basis of the sickness of Judaism when you close out, because Malachi is the book about the sickness of Judaism, isn't it? Uh, when uh, so much of that is about the uh, priests, and uh, over the next uh, uh, couple of days, again, we'll look at some more of that. Uh, now, let's uh, spend a little more time on this uh, next one, and that is the uh, the formula of prophetic utterance. Uh, notice that I have said at the top of the chart, ignore the chapters and verses and look for these markers. Uh, markers or formulas is what I'm uh, calling them. And as we uh, consider these uh, markers and uh, formulas, uh, we would uh, look at uh, things like uh, how about... Uh, uh, right here, the word of the Lord. Um, and you're reading along, and especially in the books of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and it says the word of the Lord. Now, just imagine for a moment that you don't have chapters and verses, and you're reading the book of Jeremiah, and you keep coming across the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the word of the Lord said, the word of the Lord. And that's going to come up enough times, um, for example, in the book of Jeremiah, 52 times, uh, the word of the Lord. Well, that's a phrase that's going to come out to you, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord. I would submit to you that because we have chapter 1, verse 27, verse 28, verse 29, chapter 2, now we're missing some of that because we stopped when, between chapter 1 and chapter 2, right? When the read the Bible through said stop. Uh, we stopped right there. And we're missing now the marker that says the word of the Lord. What if you took uh, the book of Jeremiah and rather than organizing it by chapter and verse, you organized it by the word of the Lord passages. And uh, you uh, begin to look at them. Uh, for example, let's uh, look at just a couple of them like uh, Jeremiah chapter uh, 11. And, pardon me, uh, Nathan, what did I do earlier that made my mouse disappear? Uh, come, come do the same thing. <laughs> um, 
But uh, does someone have Jeremiah chapter uh, 11, uh, verse uh, 1? 1 verse 11, I'm sorry. Chapter 1 verse 11. Uh, unless Nathan can get me. There we go. Thank you. Tonight I'll have to have him show me what, uh, what I'm doing. Isn't it good to have a young son? Uh, <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? Now, what if uh, we read... Uh, from there down, if we were to go to uh, verse 13, and the word of the Lord came unto me the second time. Uh, and, and you begin to notice, hey, there's a pattern. The word of the Lord the first time, the word of the Lord the second time. Uh, and you begin to look and you begin to divide those out. You're doing your own work, your own homework on it. And you begin to say, look, uh, here's 52 times I have the word of the Lord. And then you would begin to look at it and say, did the word of the Lord come 52 times? And then you might look at it and say, well, no, not exactly, because sometimes the word of the Lord came to me and the word of the Lord said. And uh, so... It'd be all packaged into one, but you would begin to divide it uh, according to this formula that you're beginning to notice the word of the Lord. Then, if you are uh, teaching, maybe, you, uh, you might say, now we're at the 14th word of the Lord. Uh, and people would begin to uh, go down, and they probably marked it, 14th word of the Lord right here, and you uh, begin to take that section. Now, I would again propose to you that that would be a much more natural way of reading the Scripture than just uh, cutting it off right uh, with the chapters and the verses. So the word of the Lord you're going to see in Jeremiah and in the book of Ezekiel, uh, 60 times in the book of Ezekiel. Or uh, also in the book of Ezekiel, you're going to see this uh, phrase, the uh, son of man. Oh, son of man. 93 times you're going to see the son of man. So the word of the Lord and son of man, many times those are going to be put together. My hunch is, and I haven't done it, but my hunch is that you're going to find there's a pattern when it says, Oh, son of man, the word of the Lord is. And puts those together, you're going to say, hey, guess what? I think we've got something new here. I think we've got a segment of scripture. Uh, in uh, the book of uh, Isaiah, interestingly, you would notice when the prophecy is to the Jews, the word is hear, awake, ho, listen. <laughs> Uh, and that's the word to the Jews, and it's going to come up again 44 times, enough times that you're going to recognize something's happening here. And if you're reading that closely, then probably you're going to notice that at other times it says, woe unto, or the burden of the Lord came unto. And you begin to see that about 21 times, and you begin to analyze it, and you begin to put it together, and you say, hey, when the prophecy is to the wicked nations or the surrounding nations, he says, woe unto. When the prophecy is to Israel, he says, awake, time for you to listen up. And you begin to separate uh, these out uh, um, at, uh, all, all the way through. And again, all of these at times are given with, uh, in, a, in a repetition within the division, as I've already mentioned. Uh, in uh, what we call the minor prophets or the latter prophets, as we'll talk about in a moment, uh, uh, the word of the Lord by uh, the word of the Lord by Malachi, or hear the word of the Lord, or the burden of the Lord, some of these that you see in uh, the, uh, t t the 12 uh, minor, so-called minor prophets, 32 times they're going to uh, come into these. So I think that when you begin to read the, uh, all of the scripture, really looking for those kind of uh, natural markers that give that kind of division, you're going to be much better off than reading according to the chapters and verses. Now, how many of you think that you're ready just to begin to ignore the chapters and verses and read according to the markers? <laughs> very, very difficult thing to do, right? Uh, and once again, I'm going to submit to you that the reason it is so difficult for us to do is because we've never done it. Uh, we have the chapters and the verses. And so we can go with the chapters and verses. We don't have to do all that. And I think that uh, many of you would agree that uh, there are things that uh, some of uh, you who are older than dirt uh, <laughs> you used, to, uh, used to do all the time. And you and everyone else around you could do it uh, without thinking about it. And yet today, a young person wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do it at all. 
uh, like, for example, read the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, and uh, probably, I, I would say 80% of you, maybe more, uh, grew up reading a King James Version of the Bible. And when you were in the second grade and someone said, read verse 12, you didn't have a problem reading that King James English. And that was because, you know, in the 1920s when you were raised, <laughs> <laughs> Everybody spoke King James, right? Well, no, they didn't speak King James when you were growing up either, but you could read King James. Why? Because that was what was put in front of you, and that was the habit that was given unto you. And uh, so you knew how to work a bailing machine, and you knew how to read King James, or whatever it is. You knew how to fix the car. You knew how to uh, do all these things. Did you see the video that went around recently about these uh, teenagers trying to use a uh, rotary phone? Uh, they absolutely could not make a phone call, uh, literally, <laughs> and uh, they, they couldn't make it work. Uh, and, uh, and, and, the, and the one place they, uh, after trying to figure out how to dial a number of times, the place they always messed up, even if they got the dialing right, is they dialed first and then they picked up the phone. Uh, because that's what you do, you know? And, uh, and uh, so none of them could, not a single one could make the call. Now, is it that kids are just that idiotic today? No. That's debatable, but... <laughs> well, the issue is they never use that. Uh, so we would all know how to use that. They wouldn't know how to use that. I, I think that... Again, this is almost just humanity. We've so accustomed ourselves to the verses that it's hard for us to stop. And, uh, and, and rather than looking at the verse, it's almost, almost impossible for us to see beyond that chapter and verse and to see, okay, let, let me just look for the patterns that are given uh, there. You know, the uh, chapters and verses really themselves are fairly modern. Uh, 1382 is uh, one of the numbers that uh, we could use. There was a, uh, uh, a, um, a guy, well, actually, let me back up just a little bit. 1277. Uh, in uh, 1277, a guy named Stephen Langton, Stephen Langton, uh, divided the Bible into chapters. No verses yet, but chapters. Um, <clears throat> And uh, Stephen Langton happened to be uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, does anyone know what the job of the Archbishop of Canterbury is? He's kind of like the Pope for the Anglican Church. He's the, uh, uh, the Bishop of Rome is the head bishop in the Roman Church. The Archbishop of Canterbury is the head bishop in the Church of England. Uh, so he holds that role of... Uh, of uh, being the, uh, the almost head of the church because they have a system in which the king is the head of the church. Uh, so uh, he's the head theologian of the church anyway. He broke it into chapters, uh, 1277. So the first English Bible that uh, used chapter divisions was 1382. Uh, so this means that, what, for uh, 1,200 years, no Christian ever had chapters chapter divisions that no, for until 1382, no one ever said, let's turn to John chapter three. Uh, because there was no John chapter three. There was just the gospel of John. Uh, that was 1382. And that was uh, the Wycliffe actually was the first English Bible, uh, the first Bible, uh, the first printed Bible out there to use the chapters and verses that Langton had uh, come up with in 1277. Uh, verses didn't actually come about until uh, even later than that, the Old Testament, it was 1444, um, and that was actually a rabbi that did the verses of the Old Testament, taking the chapters that the Anglican bishop had done, uh, and uh, he then versed out. Uh, uh, and if you, if you read uh, a Jewish history of this, and let, me, let me just say the Jews... Uh, have bought into chapter and verse divisions as much as the Christians have. Uh, so they have the same issues on this. But if you find a Jew who writes, uh, writes about it, what they will say is that for the most part, the chapter divisions were according to, uh, there's a Hebrew word that, uh, pardon me, I forgot, uh, uh, Peshura, I believe it is. Uh, the Peshura, the Pesherim is, if you see a, an old Hebrew um, 
scroll, it'll have gaps in it every now and then. Uh, and those gaps were put in by the Masoretes and uh, uh, kind of said, here's a paragraph division. Uh, for the most part, it went with those. But they will also uh, tell you that there are certain chapter divisions that they would even call heretical. Uh, you absolutely wouldn't put a chapter division there. Uh, and uh, yet those are definitely in our English Bibles. Uh, so 1440, I think I said 44, it's actually 48. 1448 uh, for the Old Testament versification. And uh, 1555 uh, for the uh, New Testament or the Greek scriptures being split into verses. Uh, so the first Bible that had chapters and verses was the Geneva Bible. Uh, the Geneva Bible is the one that the pilgrims used, uh, and uh, it was also really the first study Bible uh, because it had notes on, in the margins um, and uh, was carried out. Now, I think that, um, again, one of the reasons we don't have better division of the scriptures. I'm going to use that two ways. Uh, one of the reasons we don't have better division of the scriptures is because we just bought into the chapters and verses that were given 1,500 years after the time of, uh, uh, of the disciples, and that has become so much a part of our Christian theology that we just can't see past it. Uh, nobody would, uh, would ever consider separating John 3 out by itself until 1555. Uh, well, the chapters, 1382. Uh, before that, you would have read immediately in, from John 2 into John 3, never even having any idea of putting a line here or a division here. And then the same with verses, that wouldn't have happened until 1555, that uh, verse 16 never would have been disconnected from verse 15 and verse 17. So that, again, has uh, brought into itself uh, this uh, issue of, uh, uh, of interpreting or helping uh, us to interpret uh, what, uh, what we've got. And that then, I think, uh, has caused us not to rightly divide the word of truth in theological ways, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, I think it's in the front of the, the, the book there, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, well, if you're going to rightly divide it, uh, how do you rightly divide it? Well, of course, by chapters and verses, right? Not really. Uh, and there is such a debate in the church today. Where, 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 is, where does the right division go? And I think we've almost completely given that argument up of any kind of division, uh, that we never question the assumptions on the chapters and the verses, let alone the theological ideas. And I think that if we didn't have the chapters and verses, probably we would read the scriptures looking for divisions because along the way, somewhere we're going to have to, in a public setting, tell somebody where to turn to, right? And how in the world are we going to ever get on the same page? Now, uh, one of the, uh, it was the printing press that probably brought this about because before that the, the scripture was uh, uh, almost just publicly read and uh, everybody didn't have a copy on their phone uh, or, uh, you know, in, in their book at home. So when the printing press came about, for which we're grateful, it uh, became a little more important that all of us could open the Bible at the same place and uh, get, to, get, get to it. Uh, in the Hebrew days, uh, everybody didn't go home to their scroll and have their daily scroll reading. Uh, and so they only went to the public reading of Scripture. Give attention to the public reading of Scripture. Remember the Scripture says. Uh, so this is what they had. So uh, it came about kind of as a convenience or a necessity uh, in a modern age, but that, that which is very convenient and in that sense very necessary also somehow has tripped us up in our theology inadvertently. We didn't know that uh, providing this, uh, this new thing was going to uh, actually end up being a curse for us. You, if you want to know what, it, what it's all about, uh, just remember when email was invented. What a blessing that was, right? 
<laughs> what a curse it is today because you got 10,000 of them waiting to be answered. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I think this is what we have in the scripture. Now, I think uh, that if we were uh, able to... Um, um, able to somehow rid our minds of this, that we would begin to see more in Scripture than we're seeing right now. Uh, maybe even if we just said, well, let's at least move the verses off to the side or something, put them in the margins, uh, uh, do something a little different that helps us uh, to be reminded of uh, something. You know, I, I think that uh, by, by, the, by the way we've divided the Scripture, uh, there are sections of Scripture which almost stand independently of themselves when they shouldn't stand independently of themselves, and maybe even books of the Bible uh, that should all be part of one. Uh, but we've done this in other areas of theology as well. Remember a number of years ago, I don't know if it's taught much today or not, uh, but a number of years ago, uh, there was a little an acronym for teaching how to pray, ACTS, remember? Uh, uh, adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. And so, the, you know, how do you pray? Well, you spend time in adoration, then confession, then thanksgiving, and then supplication. Um, and it's a nice, handy little acrostic that I can remember, and it's time to pray, and I'm going to adore God a little bit, adoration, sing some praises, then I'm going to confess uh, uh, your sins, and then I'm going to uh, uh, give uh, thanksgiving, and then, and then supplication. Uh, and that was a balanced prayer life. Uh, now, again, when you think about that, somebody invented that, didn't they? And is it helpful? Is it not helpful? Let's just assume, oh, it's very helpful. It's a, it's a great thing. But we get ourselves into then thinking, this is what prayer is. It is adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And so then, I'll tell you what happens. We become kind of legalistic. Uh, and in our own prayer life, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, uh, supplication, what is it? I can't even spell acts. Uh, thanksgiving and supplication. But then the next thing that happens is... Uh, we have a public prayer, and we hear Deacon Jones, and he started with confession. Well, he doesn't even praise God. <laughs> and we begin to sort of get a legalistic, sort of judgmental kind of thing on something that was man-made just to be helpful in the beginning, uh, that, uh, you know, probably was made for this individual or little group of people that needed a little boost, and it, all, it somehow became, this is the way you're supposed to do it. Uh, and... So it's some, I guess, I'm just going to say it's human nature uh, that we need a crutch and then we depend on the crutch, right? Uh, and so what I'm trying to say is uh, realize that the chapters and verses are a crutch that might actually trip you up. Uh, and uh, we need to be uh, careful with all that. So when it comes, again, to the scripture, if what we can do is uh, to uh, begin to train ourselves to saying, I'm going to look for a pattern. Uh, and we find these patterns, by the way, all through the uh, scriptures and the books of the Bible, uh, these that I've mentioned here in, the, in uh, these uh, prophets, the word of the Lord and the Son of Man and Ho and uh, the, the book of Revelation, Behold, uh, keeps coming up over and over in the, uh, in the book of Genesis. Uh, uh, I'm going to have to paraphrase the, the statement, but uh, these are the days of, uh, uh, of, of, of Adam and then his son, you know, there's, there's this, uh, this formula that about eight or nine times comes up, and it's clear enough that we can see it. And if we would just begin reading it saying, I don't know where one subject starts and another begins. I'm going to read looking for that. Then we begin to read. I think we'll begin to find these things, and that will open us up to uh, some beautiful things. In fact, tomorrow we'll look at uh, an outline uh, of the book of Jonah, and we'll see that uh, there's some, some amazing parallels in the first part of Jonah and in the second part of Jonah that we miss because we just take chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, and put them strung out together like this, when if we didn't have that, I don't think we would string them out 1 through 6, 1 through 4, 1 through 6, 1 through 4. One through four. Uh, I don't think we would put four chapters as a linear. I think we'd put one, two, three, four, and uh, compare across. We don't do that because this is chapter three, uh, and chapter three goes after chapter two, and uh, we miss we miss all that. 
Uh, so, in that regard, there is uh, what is called on page 16, called the Sedarim of the former prophets. And uh, the uh, Sedarim, uh, what in the world is a uh, Sedarim? Uh, it is, uh, it's a division, the division of the former prophets. Uh, the, uh, before chapter and verse divisions were given, uh, Sedarim were used. And there were, in all of the Hebrew scriptures, there was 154 Sedarim. And uh, these 154 Sedarim uh, often had even a name that was given to them. Uh, and the name, of course, was always in Hebrew. And so if somebody spoke the name of a particular Sedar of the Sedarim, uh, then people who were familiarized with that kind of thing would know, ah, you're talking about this particular text of the Tanakh. Uh, and so it was broken up into, into a, 154, which is uh, basically a three-year cycle. And uh, they, in the public reading of Scripture, for three years would go through uh, on a daily basis, actually, they would go through these uh, particular, uh, not on a daily basis, excuse me, on a weekly basis, they would go through these particular uh, scriptures and carry them out. So every three years in a Jewish synagogue, you worked your way through the entire scripture, the entire Hebrew scripture, and then you went back and uh, you had it again. So it's uh, in, in today's uh, church, it might be called the liturgy or the modern or the uh, church calendar in which there's an assigned text of scripture. And those of us, again, who come from a more evangelical or fundamentalist perspective, uh, we hear of those liturgies and the church calendar and whatnot, and we put that off as uh, uh, craziness for the most part. And I understand where you're coming from. Uh, but the history of those things is before we had chapters and verses, uh, we had to say, turn to the section of scripture that has to do with the uh, fourth Sunday of Pentecost. Uh, and this is the section that we always read on, on this time of year. Now, Again, I'm not uh, really promoting this because I probably would never do it, but if you did that all of your life, you would come to the point where you associate uh, a certain time of year with a certain passage of Scripture, don't you? Uh, because every, every year at this time we read this particular Scripture, and now it's much easier to say, you remember the Scripture we read in the summer that talks about? Uh, and this was all used really to help people, again, take a big book and break it down and, and uh, find some things that were used there. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I want you to note here is of the Sederim, uh, for example, this one right here goes from Obadiah, verse 21, to Jonah, chapter 4, verse 11, which is the entire book of Jonah. Uh, these read across this way, by the way, uh, in three lines. Uh, and... Uh, the reason I say that is uh, because, here's another one, Micah chapter 7, verse 20, to Nahum chapter 3, verse 19, is that they disregarded the books and the chapters and the verses that we have today. Uh, they, uh, on uh, this particular, they would read from both Micah and Nahum and uh, put all that together. Uh, so they were done uh, in public readings without regard to our books. Now, remember we said earlier that the, uh, the, what we call the 12 minor prophets were called the 12, but they were all put into one book. I would challenge you sometime, uh, read, and you can take this as your division if you would like, uh, read uh, the 12 as a unit. And you'll find that there is some truth there that you're missing when you separate them out and read them as individuals. Uh, and uh, uh, here's something that a rabbi uh, said about uh, uh, this here. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to read my writing again. I should write more neatly. Um, ah, I'll come to it. <laughs> let's suppose you did not have chapters and verses in your Bible. What a nightmare, right? Except that, wouldn't you now be forced to learn uh, sections of your Bible? 
So you would have some particular markers in your mind. And you have some of this today. If I were to say, uh, let's turn to the chapter on faith, you would go to Hebrews chapter 11. If I said, let's go to the love chapter, you go to 1 Corinthians 13. So you have some of this in your mind. Now, if you didn't have any uh, chapters and verses, then I would say, uh, you know, uh, do you remember when the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, la da 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 And your mind, mentally, you would be forced to memorize and to know that thing which you had to know. And you know as well as I do that mentally we're just wired to, to, to learn the thing that we have to learn and to not learn the thing that we don't have to learn, right? Remember when you used to know your phone number? <laughs> And, and not only that, but you knew uh, 20, 30, 40 phone numbers. Uh, and uh, you, could, you could easily call your friend with their seven-digit phone number, and you didn't have a problem with that. My, my hunch is today that you don't know five people's phone number. Uh, and that's because you don't need to know it anymore. And why in the world would you know it when you just, you know, push a, a button or, or, or something? Uh, uh, you know, you want to call grandma, you use Instagram. Uh, <laughs> so, you, uh, you, you, the, the truth is, it, it, you, if you look at it today, you think, I could never learn all my friends' phone numbers and all my family's phone numbers. But you know you could because you did at one point. Uh, and everybody did, and it wasn't a challenge to do that. Uh, but now you don't need to do that, and we're not going to do that. I, I would, uh, again, propose to you that if we didn't have chapters and verses, we would learn the Bible better. Uh, because we would be forced to learn uh, where, where do I turn. In fact, I think we would be forced to learn uh, something that you've done in, inadvertently or naturally, I guess is a better way to put it. Naturally, you've done this with your Bible, which is why when you buy a new Bible, it's hard. You can't find anything in a new Bible, can you? Uh, because you knew where it was on the page and uh, about where it was in that, uh, you know, in, in where, do, where do I find the book of Psalms and uh, Psalm 23, you know, which side of the page am I going to look on? You would learn those kind of things uh, because you have to learn those kind of things. And I think had we not put in the chapters and verses, probably... Uh, we wouldn't have the plethora of various translations that are used today. Because for all of us to get to the same place, we're not only going to have to have the same words, uh, but we're going to have to have it really in the same place on, uh, on the page. So, you know, go to, go, uh, uh, you know, an eighth inch past the middle. <laughs> And over on the right side, uh, remember where it says? And we'd say that, and everybody would be familiar enough with the book that they would be able to say, oh, yeah, okay, I can, I can go there. Now, today, we call it Luke chapter 7, uh, and everyone goes there. But uh, do you know, by the way, that uh, if everybody had a Schofield Bible, they all have the same page numbers, uh, <laughs> regardless of which version you buy. Uh, <laughs> they all have the same page numbers, uh, which is why that's the biggest giant print that you can get, because all they do is enlarge the page or shrink the page uh, and uh, bring it. Uh, but... If we, if we had all that. Now, the quote I started to read you uh, earlier from a rabbi, he said, uh, if someone mentioned a word or two, they knew and identified that verse in its place with no need to seek for it at all. Uh, that what, what he's saying, and he was talking about before they had to, the chapter and verse divisions is, I know that verse. I don't need a name and a number for that verse. I know where that verse is. So uh, all of this, uh, as uh, you uh, uh, have seen today, is really kind of the, uh, the overall layout of the various, uh, the, the way the prophets were put together. Now what we're going to do tomorrow and Monday is begin to look at some of the divisions within that. And uh, starting out uh, with uh, the prophet Jonah in the morning and uh, begin to work our way through then uh, much of uh, what was given. And it is uh, 445.